This special election day episode of Rob Observations is brought to you by the first annual Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival. Accepting entries until December 1st. You have always wanted to make a film. Now is your chance. Are you, have, have you started the film? Are you making it? How come you're not, how come you're not making it now? How about now? Well, look. If you're not going to start now, you're never going to start. But you should. You should make a movie. We'll show it. We're waiting. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Cinema, your Archbishop of Banterbury, Chancellor of Cheerfulness, your Pharaoh of Physical Media, and of course, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I'm Rob Casting at you on Election Day 2020. The fate of the presidency is at stake. Uh, we voted in this household. Uh, California sent every registered voter a ballot. Thank you, State of California. You made it easy for us to vote. So that was fantastic. Uh, we actually procrastinated and dropped all of our ballots off last night, but I'm sure they've been counted. What's been great about California is they they give you an update where your ballot is, and if <laughs> we hadn't turned ours in, in yet, they're like, uh, guys, you haven't turned your ballots in yet. I felt, like, guilty. I'm getting robocalls and texts from... The state of California reminding me that I haven't turned in my homework. So that was kind of nice. Listen, before uh, I start, uh, one of the post geek singularity, uh, Josh Rosowskis, uh, has been in the hospital. He had some surgery, and I gave him a few shouts out now that he's been out of surgery. He sent me a video that I kept forgetting to play. He allowed me to edit it down, but it's a five minute video giving us an update on his condition. And also, he talks about Star Trek Picard. So I want to say thank you to Josh for sending this in. The man is a warrior. And obviously, he's dealt with a lot of, of physical ailments and hardship in his life. But he, uh, like like uh, the Energizer Bunny, he takes a licking and keeps on ticking. So here's hoping Josh is back to doing his YouTube show. I don't think uh, we know anybody who loves professional wrestling more than Josh. But he sent us this video I thought I would play. I thought it was appropriate for today. Kevin Burnett, the Buzz Geek Singularity, Josh here. I just wanted to thank everybody for the awesome outpouring of love. And Rob, your message really, really meant a lot to me. Um, I didn't wasn't expecting that at all and uh you know i'm just taking it day by day i don't really want to talk about what i had surgery on because it is a physical thing but you know i'm taking it day by day and little by little and i'll beat this thing rob he said take you to task for something um we don't really always have differences of opinion to be honest we're usually pretty much in line with everything only thing i guess i could say out of what you've talked about recently is that i think picard was a good idea on paper like the idea of the androids fighting back against their oppressors like i like the premise of a storyline it just had some work to do in terms of it making sense with old track and the continuity from the next generation and that's what they screwed up with but they if they had stuck to that instead of making it you know overly political and then Picard becomes an android himself 
by the very end of the show. And I guess I should have said spoiler warnings for Picard. So apologies. Maybe Rob can fix this in the edit when he gets it. But uh, yeah. Um, if they just stuck with that narrative instead of just throwing it off the rails and just focused on Data's daughters and the reasoning there, I think it could have been a decent show. But it just went off the rails because it did so many things that weren't track. So I completely concur that Picard is not Star Trek. I think the difference between what we saw with Picard and what we see with Discovery, in my opinion though, is that Picard could have been good. Like, as it started, it had a lot of potential. And then, the more and more it went on, the more and more you realize, okay, they completely bastardized and changed the character of Jean-Luc Picard, and they completely, you know, missed the boat on everything they had going. But, on the surface, it could have been good. I got the Back to the Future 4Ks, just like you. And I agree that films have never looked better, never sounded better. I kind of disagree. I like the full story arc of Back to the Future, but the first definitely is the strongest of all three of the films. But the transfers look amazing. The audio sounds great with a full soundbar setup. Um, it just has never been better. And I'm a very happy guy with that set and I picked up the steel book editions so if anybody doesn't know what that set looks like they can check out my Facebook my Twitter or my Instagram and you can see pictures of that set I, I miss doing videos and I want to get back to share my voice out there and uh, I'm very very grateful to have somebody that's has always been an idol to me, and Rob consider me a friend, and, and this community that you built, Rob, is just a wonderful place. So thank you for everything, and I will catch you all on the other side. Atomic batteries to power, turbines to speed, make it so. Well, I want to thank Josh for that video. Thank you so much. Uh, the sound, I, it, was a, it was a little weird. Obviously, it was cutting in and out there, but uh, I figured I'd play that video anyway because Josh took the time to make it from his bed after recovering from surgery. So thank you very much, Josh. And, uh, you know, we all want you to get better here. You're, you're, a, you're a foundational member of the post-geek singularity. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I've announced, obviously, that I'm going to be doing a pre-recorded show with Dieter Bastian, and I threw it out uh, <laughs> to you guys yesterday to come up with names for the show. And there is a resounding winner uh, of that of that contest. Actually, uh, we came up with the idea, and then everybody else came up with the idea. <laughs> so nobody won this one, <laughs> I have to say, because everybody said the same thing. But I, I just want to read some of these because they're pretty great. Uh, August Ragon, Ragon, August Ragon said, I'm picking up the gauntlet and have a couple of suggestions for the titles of Rob and Dieter's physical media show. Disco Videolante, Rob and Dieter on physical media. I like that. Uh, it's a throwback to Thunderball, the Disco Volante. Rob and Dieter's Let's Get Physical Media. Uh, see you round like a video disc with Rob and Dieter. Discovering discs with Rob and Dieter. Discussion with Rob and Dieter. So thank you, August. Um, and August, if it's it, he says he's the author. He must be of uh, E.J. Subaraya, Master of Monsters. Uh, I have that book, <laughs> so it's a it's a great honor. I love that book. Actually, it's I can't reach it now, but. It's over on the shelf over there. I bought that book. I pre-ordered it. I had it in my grubby little hands the day it came out because uh, everyone knows I love Japanese sci-fi. And if you don't have E.J. Subarai's Master of Monsters book from Chronicle Books uh, that August wrote 
and you like Japanese sci-fi and monsters and kaiju and all that, get that book. I can't believe that he wrote in. That's amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. Nigel Lowry says, hey, Rob, just a really quick note. We managed to get in all of our filming done uh, this weekend for a film to submit to the film festival. I am waiting for the edit to come back, but I was really disappointed with the technical quality of the shots I saw. So if, if it's as bad as I fear, the film may not be submittable. But making the film was so much fun. Hard work, but it was very interesting to put theory into practice. It's like learning the highway code and a car manual and then stepping into a car to drive for the first time. I learned so much and could write an essay on the experience, which you should do, and send it in to me and I'll read it. Uh, so thanks very much for inspiring the challenge. Anyway, my reason for writing was just to throw in a few potential titles for your new show with Dieter. So in no particular order, Slipped Discs. Pleased to media <laughs> and media storm. Well, that was it. Told you it was quick. Thanks for all your work and shows as we head into winter lockdown. And who knows what I'll look forward to. <laughs> I'll look forward to the next show as usual. Uh, this one comes in from Alan Sachs. Alan Sachs says, name for the new physical media show. The name for the new physical media show should be the Pharaoh of physical media's tomb. The title card should show physical media is dying using an Egyptian pyramid and mummy theme. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Alan. Uh, that's pretty funny. And uh, this one comes from Physical uh, Frogia. <laughs> the name of the new show should be Let's Get Physical Media, a show about fans who love and care when uh, favorite movies have been shown proper care by film studios and small independent distributors. Well... Uh, a lot of people felt like we did, and this isn't t entirely finished, but this is from our man Zevius. <laughs> I asked for a few changes. I, I think uh, Dieter, I love the fact that I'm, I'm drawn as thin as I was in college, and uh, so I guess so is Dieter. I want Dieter to, um, I want Dieter to be more metal here and uh, <laughs> have it say physical, let's get physical media. With Burnett and Bastion, which I thought was great. So thanks to Zevius for this. Outstanding, everyone. Uh, a lot of fun there. And I just, boy, did this crack me up. Uh, I thought that was just terrific. You know, it, the, the, <laughs> the creativity of the Imagination Connoisseur community never ceases to amaze me. Not just amaze me, but in the case of this, uh, it tickles me to no end. Because you guys and girls and gentle beings and however you identify across these 28 known galaxies, uh, I love you all. <laughs> so there you go. Obviously, it is election day and I, have you all voted? You know, I wasn't going to get overtly political or anything, but this story that I'm going to share is a political story, but I wanted to share it more for the larger ramifications of the international or the intergalactic film festival that was shared amongst everyone. By the way, I really liked the movie that dropped today. Um, it was very interesting, and I love uh, I love intelligent cephalopods. If you've ever read, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Stephen Baxter. If you if you have ever read any Stephen Baxter, read his Manifold trilogy: Manifold Space, Manifold Time, and Manifold Origin. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff that happens with, uh, well, octopuses, octopi in the, in that series. So check that out. Uh, and B.L. Alley wrote a book. Uh, I think it's called Cephalopod. I think. I'm not sure. But he wrote a book about it, so he can, he, he, he can tell you himself. But So I am a huge fan of author Don Winslow. Um, I've often said that they should make his uh, movies in, or his books into what I like to call the Winslow verse, where there's books like The Winter of Frankie Machine and uh, The Gentleman's Agreement. I think it's Gentleman's Agreement, Dawn Patrol. Uh, the Force was a book that came out recently. He wrote basically the Lord of the Rings of Mexican drug cartel books with Power of the Dog, The Border, and The Cartel, uh, which is great. And I think those are all getting made either into films or TV series. But he has teamed up with Shane Salerno, who's basically his agent. But Shane is a screenwriter in his own right. And Shane Salerno um, is a writer on James Cameron's Avatar sequels. Now, 
full disclosure, uh, I'm not bringing this up to pimp their work or anything in terms of what they were selling, their books and all that. Because they do, Don Winslow, one, one of the things that I've loved about Twitter is there have been authors, and I'm not saying that if you do this, you're going to get free shit. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I love books, and sometimes I'll just, for no reason at all, tweet about someone's book I'm reading, and invariably sometimes I've been, most authors are on Twitter, most of the people that I read, and I was tweeted back um, to by a few, and some have sent me galleys of their books, including... Shane Salerno has made sure that I have received the last three or four Don Winslow <coughs> novels um, before they came out, which is greatly appreciated, gentlemen, so thank you for that. But what's really been interesting is Don and Shane have teamed up and they started making political uh, videos that they were putting on social media. And I thought that was really interesting. Obviously, they're, they're very anti-Trump, but that's not why I'm bringing up the story. What I thought was really interesting is that this making films like this, making these political ads, was not in either one of these gentlemen's skill set. It's something they just thought they had to do, and they started doing it for the election. What I find interesting about that is, one, that they decided to make films, which I think is great, and two, the fact that their political videos have been seen over 100 million times during this election cycle. And that, to me, speaks to the power of... Um, what you can achieve now, it, it, it's amazing. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who puts up a video is going to, or has a YouTube channel. I mean, I've been on for for almost two years now, and I've, I've, I've built up a little past 30,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Although something has been wacky happening on my YouTube channel. Uh, people subscribe, and they drop off. I had 100 new subscribers one day, then 100 less subscribers the next day. A lot of wacky shenanigans happening on YouTube. Don't, don't really know why. But the... Um, the fact that they made these videos, the fact that you can make anybody, that's why I think it's important if you've ever decided or ever wanted to make a movie, take a shot. Look, even if it doesn't turn out so great, I mean, if you don't want to submit your film, I get it. And I'm glad that that people are having fun making their movies. But, you know, unless it turns out to be a total train wreck, why not just submit it? See what you've done. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be gone with the wind, you know. And uh, it's just fun to see people's uh, efforts and, and what's on their minds. But there's an article here that was in Deadline uh, today. Mike Fleming wrote it. It dropped at 11 o'clock today. And I thought it was really, really interesting. Why cartel author Don Winslow and Avatar sequels co-writer Shane Salerno put work on hold to make anti-Trump videos watched by 100 million people. See, these guys can be making some bank. By the way, Don Winslow's novel Savages was turned into a movie of the same name that was directed by Oliver Stone. Um. And this is sort of interesting. Many in Hollywood found ways to express their displeasure for President Trump's four-year track record, from fundraising to social media rants. And there's the tandem of best-selling author Don Winslow and his agent Shane Salerno, latter a screenwriter who co-wrote James Cameron's upcoming Avatar sequels. This campaign season, they've made dozens of short films that developed a huge online following. The shorts have ranged in focus from how the Trump administration handled issues like COVID, border enforcement, gun control, and a relationship with leaders like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un to specific segments on battleground states that will likely decide whether President Trump gets another four years or Joe Biden unseats him. The message in the films are plain spoken but have been fog cutters with collective viral penetration surpassing 100 million views. The battleground film about Pennsylvania uses the music of Bruce Springsteen and got 9 million views. Jeff Daniels provides the narration for one on Michigan, which is at 4.7 million views. Here they explain why they leaned into the filmmaking effort and the groundswell they believe the films have created without the expenditure of a single ad dollar. Winslow and Salerno wrote them together, and Salerno and his Story Factory team produced them. That's uh, Shane Salerno set up the Story Factory, and they represent a number of authors. Now, what I found interesting about this, again, it doesn't matter what your politics is. What I found interesting is that they just decided to make these movies. And yes, there's a Hollywood sheen to them, but they just started putting them up online. And the fact that they had that kind of penetration is amazing. And the idea that, you know, while it's great to protest and it's great to get your, your whatever your opinions are, are heard and out there, the fact that you can be industrial, industrial, industrious, 
and we already have the infrastructure that's there to deliver things like films, a hundred million people saw these movies. And this is something that is only possible in the present and, and with our technological state of our, our state of culture and society right now. And it's amazing that this is available. And as a tool to disseminate points of view or, or uh, opinion, now, there's been a lot about the media, but these are two private citizens that just decided to do this. They weren't being paid by anyone. They weren't taking any money from a super PAC. They just went out and did it. Now, I'm, I, I think this is amazing, and they're using the power of, of filmmaking. So I want to just read a little bit about this. Uh, what hatched the idea to do these short advocacy films? Shane Salerno says, I watch hours of political television every day while I work. I saw a few po political shorts on MSNBC. They were very rough. I thought that there could be a different approach, more cinematic, more focused on storytelling, stronger use of music and voiceover. Dawn had built a strong platform on Twitter over the years with lots of very prominent celebrities, journalists, news anchors, major athletes and musicians, and political commentators. I saw an opportunity. I thought if we could produce really strong political videos, that a powerful platform already existed to launch them. I felt it could be a good marriage, and fortunately, I was right. One of our earliest videos was about Bill Barr's corruption, and it quickly hit one million views. People were impacted by that video. We were stunned that we could reach a million people in a few hours. It galvanized us to do more and to make better videos. The videos grew in ambition and began to focus on Trump and his catastrophic policies. We started to see our videos hitting 2 million views, then 3 million, then 4 million views, and some reached 6 million and 7 million views. Remarkably, the cumulative number of views for all of our videos just surpassed 100 million views. We've also had several videos reach number one on Twitter trending. <coughs> we never imagined numbers like that, especially since we have never taken any donations or set up a political pack. We're entirely self-funded while others have raised tens of millions of dollars. Don Winslow says, What astonishes me is how fast it happens. We can put out a video and be over a million views in two hours. By the end of the day, we're often at four, five, or six million views. That's an incredible impact. It's exciting to watch the videos grow by the hour and to see how people are responding and what they are saying. Journalists and celebrities have been instrumental in spreading our videos. For instance, Jimmy Kimmel retweeted our video about the children locked in Trump's border prisons. His retweet goes out to 12 million followers. Mark Ruffalo has been a major supporter, and he has 7 million followers. Ben Stiller, Judd Apatow, Stephen King, Rosie O'Donnell, Jake Tapper, John Cusack, Nicole Wallace, Joy Reid, Patricia Arquette, Sarah Cooper, and even Mary Trump, to name a few of the roughly 500 celebrities and journalists who regularly share our videos. <coughs> And then they ask, Don, you're an author of mainstream fiction, and it's best for your business to reach and not polarize book buyers. Shane, you produce these as well as Don's, uh, as well as Don's rep, your interest star line, and you are also a screenwriter. None of your business aims are helped by taking such a strong political position. What has the current administration done in your mind to risk alienating readers who've bought your books and new readers who might buy them? Winslow, the costs that we have experienced are nothing compared to the thousands of children Trump locked in cages for years, crying themselves to sleep every night, many physically and sexually abused, or the horror their parents felt every night wondering if their children were okay. I'm 67 years old and I became an overnight sensation in my mid-50s thanks to Shane. I drove the same car for 20 years, so I'm not exactly what you would call a big spender. I was compelled to do this because of the horrors that Trump has unleashed on the country. So... Have you ever done anything like this before? Salerno, I've been active in different ways, particularly consulting, but this was the first time I was moved to basically shut down my life and make political videos. I felt the stakes were that important. Kids in cages, three young Supreme Court judges who will be f on the court for decades, 200 federal court judges with lifetime appointments, <coughs> a complete attack on the free press and major government institutions like the FBI. <coughs> Sorry, there was, it was very dusty and I got dust in my throat. Hmm. The Justice Department, the State Department, the CIA, without sounding dramatic, we were called to this fight. Don Winslow says, I've never done anything like this before either. Trump's behavior demanded we do something, and when the video started to take off and connect with people on such a large scale, <clears throat> we just kept making more and more working insane hours. Ultimately, we're two pissed off writers with our own money who decided to go to war against Donald Trump. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. Now, again, my point is not to bring this up for the politics of it. My point is to bring this up to prove or to illustrate how anybody, 
Now, admittedly, Don Winslow had a base on Twitter from which to operate from and already had a number of celebrity supporters. But the fact is, you can do anything. You can take up any cause. And by utilizing the infrastructure that's been built, whether it's Vimeo, whether it's obviously YouTube, whether it's Twitter, um, everyone talks about how toxic the internet can be. That is true. It absolutely can be. But imagine if you wanted to make somebody aware of, I don't know, anything. Whatever your cause is, whatever you want to take up, uh, it doesn't even have to be a cause. If you want to just, I don't know, like if I was in Cannon Beach right now, I would make a video about Bruce's Candy Kitchen and how I love their cinnamon saltwater taffy. And I've been buying it since I first went to Seaside and Gearhart when I was five years old <coughs> in Cannon Beach because that's what I would do. And I would put it on the internet <laughs> and sing the praises of Bruce's Candy Kitchen in Cannon Beach, Oregon and how much I love their cinnamon saltwater taffy. And you can do that now. And, and the people that... You know, if you take the time to learn a little editing software and 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 put some finesse into it, the the ideas and the way we share things now can be incredibly productive. And the same is true if you know if you wanted. I mean, people have asked me why we're not putting Tango Shalom uh, into the film festival. Well, you know, we're hoping to sell it. I can't just release it online on my own film festival for free on YouTube. So that's why. Uh, we're not doing that, but I'm still going to be promoting. You're, you're going to see a lot more about Tango Shalom. I've actually made a two-hour documentary on the making of Tango Shalom, believe it or not, which I'm still kind of cutting down. It'll, it'll end up being probably 90 minutes, but that might be something I'll just release online because I can to promote the film, but it's pretty amazing. And one of the things that I've been astonished by uh, with our film festival you know, <clears throat> we have people like Dieter, obviously Dieter Bastian and Patrick Keller making The Secret Exchange. But, you know, B.L. Alley just tossed off a film, The Trip, which is, never ceases to make me chuckle. Uh, Trinidad the Island Man, Your Island Man. He made an 18-minute movie about where he lives in the the state of COVID Hawaii. And actually, it's pretty hard-hitting. It brought a tear to me eye at the end. It's, it's sad, but he's also advocating for people that... Uh, who are perhaps suicidal, that places they can call and who they can get in touch with. So not only was it a fictional uh, fictionalization of uh, or a story, but it was also a place, well, a reminder, his film was a reminder that there's people out there that, that can help and maybe it could save, you never know, but maybe it'll save a life. Um, so it's it's just amazing with our technology and our the state of the world today how you can get your voice out, how you can be heard. And I'm, you know, I'm a big advocate of that. I'm a big advocate of, of making movies and, and, and hearing. See, it's not, it's not necessarily about, when I say that we want uh, to listen to people, and when I talk about how I do believe in inclusion, and I do believe in diversity, but I believe in those things because we need to hear the voices of people. Just showing people is not enough. You have to hear their stories. You have to understand the plight and and the lives that people have led. And and a lot of people don't. You know, and I think one of the most potent, I've always thought that the most potent form of communication that we've ever come up with is, well, films, whether they're true-to-life documentary films or they're fictional narratives. It's incredibly powerful. It's all of the art forms rolled into one with the added benefit of technology. Uh, it's incredible. And now we're all carrying around supercomputers in our pockets that have very high-resolution cameras, and there's no reason why you can't. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to be Francis Ford Coppola or Orson Welles, but, I mean, this film festival has proven, I think, there's a lot of diversity in terms of the content, whether uh, you're, you're watching a sausage talk about your mom's tatas or you're watching uh, BL Alley on the can taking a trip through the Stargate. You know, you just never know what you're going to get. So uh, I do think that seeing that Don Winslow and Shane Salerno, who felt a political call to action, decided to use filmmaking and, and did just that. Um, they they fought the good fight. They brought their own political views to the fore. 100 million people saw those movies. And whether you're pro-Trump or 
anti-Trump or you're pro-Biden or anti-Biden or you're a Bernie bro or not, whatever. Anybody could do that. Anybody could make films. And, and I think it's constructive. And it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't necessarily have to believe in the message of the movies. But to get those kinds of messages out using the power of film, <coughs> potent indeed. And look, I'm a huge Don Winslow fan. I highly recommend his books on the drug cartels, Power of the Dog, uh, The Border. Or this, is it Power of the Dog, The Cartel, The Border, or the other way around? I don't remember. <coughs> but definitely good stuff. And uh, read his books. Uh, the Winter of Frankie Machine is a movie that was going to get made by Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, and they ended up making The Irishman instead. But I still think that book is great. So check it out if you want. Um, Stubble McShave, by the way, also, um, <laughs> uh, said, uh, he said, I can't even, you know what? I, I don't want to, I don't know how to say this, but I guess it's physical film with Dieter. Uh, but uh, I like how Stubble wrote it. So I'm going to put it in the live chat. So here it is. <clears throat> so thanks for that Stubble. I still feel bad for Stubble because of, uh, of what happened with um, Wheel of Time. It's just, it's uh, it's sad. This next one, Emil Johansson. Oh, wait, I, I can't get to that now because I have to read his first one before I can get to that one. Uh, this one comes from uh, Jason Webster. It says, Hi, Robert. I hope the week has left yourself and the marvelous members of the Post Geek Singularity feeling jovial enough to face the week ahead with panache and vivacity. I just finished reading the letter by the Post Geek Singularity's chairman, Jeffrey Mao, regarding his review of Sir Alfred Hitchcock's classic To Catch a Thief. I agree with everything he conveyed of his observation of the film. The film, along with North by Northwest, are my favorites from the classic era of Hollywood. I agree it is the best example of what three men, Alfred Hitchcock, Robert Burks, and Cary Grant, can achieve at the very top of their game. Craftily directed, beautifully photographed, and superbly acted, the film is everything one could hope for in a thriller. Hitchcock was a master of directorship, and the film is, a consistent, is consistent in its narrative and pacing and never wavers, allowing the film to flow as smooth as silk. No sequences feel stilted or jerky or abrupt. The film never lags, nor does it overplay the suspense. Everything just fits together nicely and allows the audience to enjoy the film. The richness and the contrast of color during the day sequences and the effective use of light and shadow for the night sequences and the framing of these sequences by Robert Burks make To Catch a Thief required viewing for any film production student dreaming of becoming a cinematographer. Cary Grant was a terrific actor. The talent and experience to naturally portray characters that required suaveness and charisma with consummate ease as showcased in this film. He breezes through the film and commands every scene. However, like in all of his other roles, he never overplayed his character, allowing his interaction with other cast members to seem natural and believable. His Roby can be charming and understated. Even today, audiences can still easily say to themselves, they know or have heard of people that come across just like John Roby. It's criminal Grant never received the Best Actor Academy Award during his career. However, he did receive a well-deserved Honorary Academy Award in 1970 for his wonderful contribution to film over a long and incredible career. This film and North by Northwest are the best examples of Hollywood classics that do not require a remake. Why mess with perfection? Sincerely, Jason Webster. Great take, Jason. Uh, I love that. I um, Thank you very much. We got a letter from Ian Samuels. Hello, Ian. How are you, sir? Rob and fellow Rob observationists. So with the stuff that is going on with Star Trek not being so great, let's have a look at what's going on in a galaxy far, far away. We have the second season of the groundbreaking The Mandalorian. The first episode gave us a huge dump of fan service. It was still a great episode, but it's a shame that there was so much fan service in a single episode. The series has promised to start production of season three before the end of this year and has also been, been given a green light on season four. It has also been announced that pre-production has started on the next Star Wars movie, one directed by Taika Waititi. They are preparing to film scenes in the Scottish Highlands. We have the full-on Disney-branded Star Wars with the High Republic, 
novels, comic books, and young readers' novels coming soon before a promised series of films. It has also been confirmed that Ryan Johnson is still getting his own Star Wars trilogy, which is surprising considering the disastrous changes they made to Rise of Skywalker based on the fan backlash over The Last Jedi. Also, they are hoping to start work early next year on the Cassian Andor series and later next year on a single season of the Obi-Wan series. So, some exciting stuff. Some worrying stuff. I, for one, am looking to the first of the new High Republic novels as an introduction to a near period, new period of Star Wars history. Ian. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> look, as much as I enjoy The Mandalorian, I have to tell you, and I, I, I really like the first episode a lot, but I don't think it's great. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is it's certainly a lot of fun, but there's just not a whole lot there. I mean, I like the I like the Western tropes, and I like the characters, and I liked look, I liked getting to know the Sand People more, the Tuscan Raiders more. I mean, I did, I really, I did dig that aspect of all of it. But you know, I, I wish it was a little bit more substantial. I, I would love to see a Star Wars series that had the kind of depth that the Expanse has, and I'm kind of you know, I'd like to see more places than just, I mean, that's the second time the show went back to Tatooine. And I mean, I get it, but like, come on, man, there's a lot of planets in the galaxy. I'd rather see planets we haven't seen, but I mean, I'm still enjoying the heck out of it. So there you go. Um, So why not? Uh, this one comes from our friend Electron Star Collapse. Dun, dun. I love saying that. Electron Electron star collapse. Greetings, Rob. This is a bit of a downer of a topic, but I write it in the defense of digital media. It's with a heavy heart, because I do still prefer physical media over digital. However, I have to press the idea that there is a place where digital media would be preferential over physical. What? What? I hope it's not too depressing to go on air, but I only bring it up because I feel it's pertinent. I'll just give the really short version of my awful story, as it's all that's important to the argument. I've already stated my parents owned a video store, and some of the inventory ended up on our personal video library at home. I also had a substantial collection of movies, video games, vintage computers, and game consoles and model kits in the house, and most of it burned down in a fire without insurance to help recover the lost assets. Oh my god, my worst effing nightmare. I'm very sorry. Before continuing... I want to quickly interject that a number of good things resulted for me directly and indirectly due to the house fire. Also, everyone came out safely, including the animals. However, all of this is not too important for the continued argument, but I wanted to at least allow for people to not feel too bad about the situation. What I didn't lose was my Steam and GOG libraries. To be fair, this was during the transitional period where physical PC titles were phasing out. However, once I built myself a new computer over the course of the next few months... I already had games I could play. Also, Netflix and Amazon made it much easier to not have to buy back every single lost title. I know they don't have every title, and Netflix cycles through its titles as well, but the monthly access fee is much easier to afford than the hundreds of dollars to get back everything. There's nothing I can do about the model kits, but my Metal Gear Rex kit from the first Metal Gear Solid survived. I hope to actually build it soon. I bet that's badass. I only held back due to my poor painting skills, but I'll make it happen regardless. But as I said, I do still prefer physical media, even if I can't trust that it will always be there. The special features were always interesting to watch, which are often missing from the digital forms. I also remember the old Commodore 64 games and even some DOS titles <clears throat> that would come with the feelies, like cloth maps, coins, or even a microscopic space fleet in a plastic baggie for the Hitchhiker's Guide game. Also, having the media in a tangible form makes it more significant. My Steam library says I have 2,069 games as of today. 69, dude. Uh, yet scrolling through a list of games uh, to play never gives me the same satisfaction of looking through a shelf for a game I'd want to play. I got to tell you, that is, um, that's I, I, I feel you. And I like going to a shelf and, and let your fingers do the walking. And find stuff that you like and pull things out and read the back and look at the packaging. I mean, I, I do think of my, well, all this stuff as objects do art. And I like that. You know, I really, I really like that. <clears throat> uh, I used to be able to say that digital media might be taken away from us while physical media is ours and won't go away. But I've, but as I've found, you can't trust any media will be there tomorrow. So it's good to try and enjoy it while you can. 
Don't worry about the stars collapsing on me. To reference Free Enterprise, I know who is my Trixie, and she was there for me back then and here for me today. Though I'd really say she's more of my Sailor Moon. Don't let the stars collapse on you. <clears throat> well, Electron Star Collapse, a good uh, a, a good letter, and thank you for that. And um, I think that was good. I like that. Let's see. This one comes from um, Richard uh, uh, Grotebass, 1964. <clears throat> Richard Van, I can't even pronounce this, Tujver? It's, yes. <clears throat> hail to the movie and TV oracle called RMB, and hail to all the geeks, nerds, and imagination connoisseurs. It is I, Grotebass, 1964, a.k.a. Richard Van... You know what? T-W-U-I-J-V-E-R. I can't... You know, I, I had a hard enough time learning how to pronounce Rene Stausendijk's name, or Monique van de Ven. From the Netherlands, let's have some fun, shall we? I'm going to talk about comedy and humor. Accor uh, according to too many writers and actors, one of the most difficult disciplines to master. I'm not an actor, but I'm someone who likes to write, and yes, humor is difficult to put on paper. What I think is funny doesn't mean everybody agrees with me. Most likely, 50% at least of my readers don't even chuckle. Imagine being an actor. He or she must not only recite the script. No, they also have to use the right facial expressions, body language, and much more to get the joke across. <clears throat> For example, one is from The Next Generation when Data, Riker, Troy, and Worf are playing poker. Riker and Data got most of the chips in hand, and Riker challenges Data for an all-or-nothing bet. Riker performs a card trick and smiles afterwards, thinking he fooled Data. He couldn't be more wrong. Data explains in detail how Riker did it, and he wins the pot. The facial expressions on Riker and the others tell all. Without speaking, you know what they're feeling and thinking. And here is a YouTube clip so we know what he's talking about. I'll put this into the live chat <clears throat> so you can see it. A few of my my American comedy movies are, why do I specify American? I can hear you think, but just for a moment, it will soon become, become clear why. For example, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith from 2005. This action comedy movie is a great example of what I like to watch. Uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt clearly had fun making this movie. Their chemistry is great. The banter between the two is fantastic. And the physical humor is great as well as the verbal. Another one of my favorites is Down Periscope from 1996 with Kelsey Grammer, Lauren Hawley, and Rob Schneider. This is a different kind of humor, more corny and silly. It's a movie where if you like this kind, you will be laughing throughout the whole movie. The last American one is Caddyshack from 1980. I love Caddyshack. With Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, and Rodney Dangerfield. Whenever you feel down, watch this movie to cheer yourself up. Some movies closer at home from the UK. I love British humor, even more than American humor. Sorry, but it's true. A few examples, all the movies with Peter Sellers. I first met Peter Sellers in the movie The Party. If you would ask me to describe this movie with one word, I would say slapstick. Here he is at his best, without almost speaking a word. He makes me hurt from laughing so much. If you haven't seen this m m movie, please do, and tell us what you think. Another British piece of movie history are the Monty Python movies and TV series. A movie like The Life of Brian is a brilliant comedy, tackling all kinds of things wrong in the world. Nowadays, the big movie companies wouldn't dare make a movie like this. They would be overwhelmed with complaints from all kinds of people and organizations because it is not PC in this day and age, just like Blazing Saddles. An actor who I admire because of his physical comedy is Rowan Atkinson. He's been in many movies and TV series and never fails to deliver. A great example of this kind of humor is The Plank with Tommy Cooper, Eric Sykes, and Jimmy Edwards. This movie is made without speaking a word on screen. They only tell you the story with their actions, facial expressions, and body language. And you can find this movie if you want to see it on YouTube. <clears throat> for now, take uh, my for now my take on what I like, Rob. What are your favorite comedy movies and actors, domestic and abroad? Even more important, can you tell me and maybe your viewers what the difference is between American humor and the British kind? I tried to figure it out myself, but can really I can't really explain it in words that make sense. Kind regards, Grotobos, nineteen sixty four. Live long and prosper. Ooh, that's a. Uh, what is the difference between British and American humor? I think that there can be an element of surrealism to British humor that American humor doesn't tend to have in it. Um. And I think that there is a uh, British humor can tend to be more indirect 
as opposed to the directness of American humor in movies and TV, if that makes any sense. I mean, that's that's just me. I haven't really thought about it since you're just asking me in this letter right now. I haven't really contemplated it, but, uh, I, you know, I really like situational humor where the humor is derived out of, of the, the situations that characters find themselves in. Like, for instance, you know, I, one of my favorite comedies of all time is Tootsie. Uh, I think Tootsie is, is a fantastic comedy, but it's never it never goes too over the top. And the world that Tootsie takes place in is the real world. I mean, it's it's a film when Dustin Hoffman decides to play um, um, Dorothy. Uh, what's her? Oh God, why can't I think of her name? Um, uh, Dorothy is it? Dan, oh God, Dorothy Michaels. Uh, when 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 he decides to play Dorothy Michaels. It's not played out as, look at this wacky guy. I mean, yeah, he trips in his high heels once. But it's played straight for the most part. Like, okay, here's his ploy to get work. He's a working actor, and he decides to dress up as a woman. I'm very proud to be a woman, Dr. Brewster. Uh, and what I love about it is it's what would happen, the absurdity of what would happen to him in that situation. And I, I really like it. I think it's very funny because it's it, it's all about the real world. What would really happen if somebody did this? And and to me, the script is incredible. The acting is incredible. The entire cast is incredible. I also love another one of my favorite comedies of all time is Arthur, the original Arthur. And while it does have, it does have funny lines of dialogue, um, it also has a lot of heart to it and and i you know i like that and modern comedies like i i really loved get him to the greek i love forgetting sarah marshall but i really love get him to the greek i love things like i love you man and then when i was a kid i watched animal house a hundred times it's one of those movies i can recite and i did love stripes and i did love uh all of the meatballs and 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 uh uh those kinds of of movies that are a little bit more absurd but uh those are the things that that uh that i really that i really like but as Elizabeth says, I, I don't tend to watch uh, a lot of funny movies. I mean, I, I really like Woody Allen's movies and a lot of the movies like Annie Hall that people are saying are so his, like some of his funniest movies are also set in the real world. Like I don't I don't like really body over the top comedies very much. Uh, I, I do like that situational humor. I don't know what that says about me, but uh, there you go. Uh, interesting letter. Thank you for sending that to me. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for that. <clears throat> now, today, everyone, is National Sandwich Day. It is, as Paul from Long Beach pointed out. And Throg Me to Hell, our, our boy Throg, writes in and says, Dear Rob, I am an atheist. I don't think I've claimed that enough. Hello, Mrs. Yerke. Lady Throg commands me to say. Here in The Rock, the ROC, we have a unique sandwich plate, and it's called a garbage plate. And here is a link to explain. Um, I'm going to read it. Uh, and this comes from Nick Tahu Hots. Nick Tahu Hots is a Rochester, New York restaurant. It's Nick Tahu Hots is a Rochester, New York restaurant featuring a dish called the Garbage Plate. The restaurant was founded in 1918 by Alex Tahu, the grandfather of the 21st century owner, also named Alex Tahu, and named for Nick Tahu, the founder's son, who operated the establishment until his death in 1997. While there are other upstate New York variants, Nick Tahu's is the originator of the trademark Garbage Plate. A garbage plate, according to a 2010 archive of the restaurant's official website, starts with a base of any combination of home fries, macaroni salad, or baked beans, or french fries topped by your choice of meats and dressed to your liking with spicy mustard, chopped onions, and our signature Nick Tahu's hot sauce. Each plate comes with two thick slices of fresh Italian bread and butter. Another site wrote that Tahu concocted his original combo plate with two hamburger patties and a choice of two sides, usually some combination of home fries, macaroni salad, and beans. The contents are often laced heavily with ketchup and hot sauce and mixed together before eating. Rolls or white bread are served on the side. Health.com named the garbage plate the fattiest food in the state of New York. Now back to 
Throg's letter. Buffalo has wings. We here eat a garbage plate. And don't let that name fool you. There are multiple combinations because there are so many different types of food. What wouldn't you want covered in a nice spicy meat sauce? Well, thank you, Throg. There you go. I was hoping we'd get more more people would write in about National Sandwich Day. But what can you say? Now, here's a letter that came from our own The Richard. That's right, our own moderator. And you know what? The Richard had never written into the show before. Now he has. And I am going to share it with you. <clears throat> Rob, long-time viewer, <laughs> first-time writer. Dude, I just watched your intro to the Star Trek experience. I never saw the video. I first arrived in Vegas in October of 2003. I believe it just ended its run. Motherfucker, that video has me in tears. My God, man, that was perfection. I remember being bummed that it was closed. We walked around the outside of the exhibit to absorb what might have been. If you don't mind, could you go back in time and give me a heads up? My email at the time was, and still secondary is, time traveler at xxxxx. So just, I do not laugh out loud. I'm probably still a bit delirious, but I wanted to say I'm okay. I had dehydration from the stomach bug again. I think that video right there might end up being an instrument for the mending of an important relationship and responsibility I happen to be overdue on. Thank you for everything, always, The Richard. Well, um, what The Richard is referring to is I recently came across, when I worked on the Star Trek experience, I had created two, uh, actually we'd made three videos that were on these giant Giant. So when you walked into the Star Trek experience, there was a big 20-foot enterprise, motion picture enterprise. But there was also these giant video screens that were playing these three videos that we made. Two of them were these uh, videos that I cut that were very emotional. That The idea was to try and capture the essence of what Star Trek was in a four-minute video montage. And then one of them was a battles video so to show that there's a lot of action and adventure in Star Trek. And I found... I, I'm trying to find, I thought I had it, the third video that I had done, but I put it up, it's in the Axonar playlist video on the website if you're looking for it, but Star Trek Experience, you can probably go to the page and, and see them, and so the, the Battles video was mostly cut by Dave DeVos, filmmaker Dave DeVos, who was my boss at the Star Trek Experience, and then I had cut the other one, but I found all the shots for Dave. And what it was a lot of fun. I mean, the Star Trek experience for me, I've told the story before uh, how I got that job. I had made a, uh, a Star Trek montage called Star Trek Eternal. There's a really lame copy of it on, as a matter of fact, allow me to find it for you. Um, it's on my old YouTube page. Um, so let's see. And there it is. Star Trek Eternal. Um I published this on YouTube. I'm sorry it's so low quality. It was from a VHS tape. But uh, I posted this on two, in 2007. Um, but but So you can see this. And I, I made this video in a day. Um, I had whatever Laserdiscs or, um, Laserdiscs or VHS tapes at the time we had on hand. And I was doing it for this award ceremony when I used to write for Sci-Fi Universe magazine. Our second award show, the Sci-Fi Universe Awards, we I made all these videos that I showed. We we gave awards to like Sid Marty Croft, and um, Majel Barrett came. And we gave her a, an award, so I made this video and I just called it Star Trek Eternal with what I had on hand. And it was you know it's before it was before YouTube where everybody is making Star Trek montages. And I use this piece of music that is on the soundtrack for Nixon. It's a John Williams John Williams soundtrack for Nixon. And it's a piece of music called The 60s, The Tumultuous Decade, I think it's called. And I, when I heard that piece of music, they did it for like the trailer of Nixon. And I'm like, this piece of music is so great. And I just wanted, I always wanted to cut a Star Trek montage to it. So I did. And that video, that summer, people kept asking me for the video. And I'm, I was like, Okay, so I finally had to charge people because I had to go buy these videotapes, these five-minute videotapes that I put the video on, and I sent out, I must have sent out 100 copies, VHS copies, and one day, I get a phone call from Landmark Entertainment, and they said, 
um, are you Rob Burnett who made this Star Trek Eternal video? And I said, yeah, because I put my name on the front of it, my phone number. And they're like, we'd like to have a meeting with you. So I came down and met with, uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't remember who I, the name of the guy I met with. I remember his office and I could tell you, I think it was Ted. So I go in there and he asks me, they like the video and he asks if I would have any interest in working on the Star Trek experience. And my job would be to edit videos, to edit montage videos that would go in the, in the museum portion, like a, a Borg video or a Klingon video or a Romulan video. And I'm like, oh my God. And then they're like, yeah, we're probably going to have bigger videos that are going to play that are general that over sort of give you an overview of Star Trek. I'm like, this is my, my dream job. And I said, well, yes, absolutely. And it was very funny. And he said to me, he goes, well, so how well do you know Star Trek? And I'm like, well, you know, um, I know, I know Star Trek pretty well. And he goes, all right, well, say I needed to find a shot where, I don't know, a Klingon stabs a Romulan or a Romulan stabs a Klingon. And without missing a beat, I said, well, I would, I would look at the, um, the sixth season Next Generation episode, uh, Birthright Part 2. And he looks at me and he thought I was joking. And I explained, well, no, you know, Worf goes, there's a, there's a Romulan prison ca- uh, encampment that has been keeping Klingons there for a long time. I don't know if there, you'd get exactly what you want, but that would be the first place that I would look for that kind of a, of a shot. And he basically looked at me, realizing I wasn't kidding, and he said, okay, you're hired. So I spent a year and a half, I mean, for the first four or five months, all I did every single day was before I could edit back then, like with the, with an Avid, you had to play a tape in real time as you digitized it into the computer. And that was the only way you could edit. So they gave me from Paramount at the time, uh, Deep Space Nine was in its third year. Yeah, because I had the search, and I think Voyager was in its second or something. So Paramount sent me, up until then, every single Star Trek uh, show. So for four or five months, I went into work all day. I got paid, and I would watch like 10 episodes of Star Trek a day. And I would just upload them into the computer and then break the episodes down, like each planet, each girl Kirk kissed. Each time Dr. McCoy said, I'm a doctor, not a moon shuttle conductor, you know, or something like that. And then for the next year and a half, all I did was edit Star Trek videos and talk about a great job. I mean, it was amazing. We were working on the $80 million Star Trek experience. And then uh, one of the things we had to do for the ride film, there was a ride film, a big simulator film, but we needed to shoot you were on the bridge if you never went there they had a full recreation of the next generation bridge that you went on and you saw this transmission from from uh, Vaughn Armstrong play this Klingon and what was amazing about it was we had to go shoot that so we literally went to Paramount were on the set of Deep Space Nine when they were shooting an episode called Soldiers of the Empire and LeVar Burton was directing. So I literally am on the set watching LeVar Burton direct a Deep Space Nine episode. And when they were done shooting for the day, we jump on and we shot our, it was a single shot, but we jump onto the Bird of Prey bridge set and we got to shoot. And there I was, you know, there I was part of the team shooting, shooting stuff on the actual <laughs> Klingon Bird of Prey set uh, in the Deep Space Nine episode, Soldiers of the Empire. So I mean, come on. <laughs> How much fun was I having? Let me tell you, uh, I was having a lot of fun. <laughs> so in case there was any uh, it, it, that you'd ever wondered about that. Uh, this comes from Star Wars Rocks. Hi, Rob and fellow PGS members. I just came across a rather interesting post on Facebook from the official DC Extended Universe Community Group about the former DC Universe streaming service, Titans, the original show that's now been moved to HBO Max. I may or may not have put down a down payment on a six-scale Robin from Titans. Uh, Third party, not officially licensed, but it's tasty. Uh, That's now been moved to HBO Max, and apparently the gist of it is that they're looking for a black actor to play Tim Drake. Both the creator of the post and I share the same concerns, 
about this, and it is the comment I left below. It, I really wish DC would stop doing this with their TV shows. They need to stop pandering to the lunatic SJWs in Hollywood. That's why they're casting a black actor to play Tim Drake's Drake to satisfy them and piss off their actual fans. Uh, a few minutes later, I got a reply from someone who I can only assume is a social justice warrior, and this is what he said to me. Lunatic, you ra effing racist oaf. So after I read that reply, I was like, oh, social justice warriors actually do know how to spell. Then another thought came to me that you're insulting me for no reason. You're a spineless idiot with no backbone, and it wouldn't be, it would, wouldn't be so entertaining if it wasn't so funny. Thanks for reading. Well, Star Wars rocks. Here's my thoughts on this. So I have to tell you, I was a huge Teen Titans fan. Still am. New Teen Titans fan. I love, they were my favorite superhero team. I mean, the Justice League is my favorite superhero team of all time. But I love the New Teen Titans. One of my favorite characters because I, I, uh, I used to have a girlfriend that kind of looked like this character. I love redheads. I loved Starfire. Corandar, uh, or Coriander. If someone said to me, no, it's Coriander, like the... I never, I never pronounced her name that way, Coriander. Okay, maybe it is. Maybe that makes sense. I used to say Corandar, like Commandar, like she's an alien, so I could never say Coriander, but maybe I got it wrong. I don't know. But I love Starfire. And what was interesting to me was I love Starfire because she was a redhead. And I was, when they were going to do the, the, the Titan series, I'm like, I wonder who they're going to cast to play Starfire. And of course, she was cast with a black actress. She was cast, uh, uh, and, and and to me, the thing about her is I was curious to see, like, I thought they would go the Manta, Manta, like Mantis and Guardians of the Galaxy. Mantis is an alien, just like Starfire is an alien, and that was one of the things that I wanted to see them do, like her skin color, the, her big eyes, the big flowing hair. And obviously that would have been exp expensive, you know, if they did that. And... I was like, okay, but when I started watching Titans, I didn't mind the actress playing Starfire. It was just a different take on the character. I don't think that, other than the fact that Tim Drake uh, is white in the comics, I have no problem uh, shifting or, or, or deciding to make Robin black. That doesn't make any difference to me, because I don't think, I don't think that Robin, it, it doesn't matter if Robin is really white or black or, I mean, East Indian or whatever. He could be Asian. It doesn't it doesn't really matter, other than the fact that that's the way he has been in the comics and maybe in animated shows for a long time. But to recast Robin and make Robin black could fit right in. I mean, the, the he was a gymnast, his family, the Traveling Graysons or, or whatever. There's no reason to me why Robin can't be black now with starfire it's different because she's an alien and it seems strange that they cast a black actress to play that role but i understand why they did it but when it comes to things like diversity i mean if you wanted to make robin black i don't have a problem with that uh you know i just i don't um depending on how they're going to write the story i mean i've always thought that Obviously, the idea of diversity, you have people that have different experiences and different voices. And if they made Robin Black, I would like them to delve into the fact that what does that mean? What did it mean for this character to be black growing up and becoming a crime fighter? Like, does this Robin, if you're black, have any ideas about the fact that African Americans, that black Americans have a much larger presence in our prisons than other ethnic groups? And would that be something that you could weave into the character of Robin? I think that would be interesting. So that could be helpful as far as uh, a character in Batman is concerned. Now, I understand, as a longtime comic fan, and I'm one of them, as you can see, when they do crazy shit like changing the gender or or swapping, swapping the race of a character or something, I know it, it drives people crazy, because. but that's the same thing is true if they change the costume in a movie. So I don't think that every comic book fan that that says I, I don't want Robin to be black is necessarily any kind of, I don't think it's a racist statement at all. I think people, comic book fans want comic book characters to look like they look in the comic books. And, and uh, that's at least that's the way I've seen it. I mean, I get that, but I also think that from a movie perspective, it can be more interesting. You know, if you want to change it up, like I thought the Robin in the dark Knight returns 
which I have right up there on my shelf. I thought it was interesting that they made Robin uh, into a female character, the new Robin. I thought that was a good choice. I thought that added something interesting to the story. And that's my whole thing. If you're going to swap the race or, or gender or sexuality or whatever of a character, I don't object to that necessarily, but I would like to have a reason for why you did that. Like if you wanted to make, I don't know, Robin LGBTQ for some reason, well, how do we how do we then weave in the fact that you're writing a, a queer Robin character and make that work within the context of Batman? I mean, that was probably a bad example because now people are going to make jokes about this. But you know what I mean. Whether you're going to make Robin black or gay or, or make Robin a, a woman or somebody from a different country, I, you know, I don't know. But you've got to make those changes and then address them in the character and make that work. That's what I, that's what I think. I mean, you could just, just the problem is if Robin's been raw, you know, a white dude for like seventy five years, and then you turn him into a black dude, and then you don't address that, and he just goes about his business. I think that's odd because in the reader's mind, you're always going, "I wonder why they swapped that character out to be black." Is there a reason for it? And and when you do that. In the, in the minds of your of your readers, it becomes strange because your readers are there waiting to understand why you did that. Um, but I guess, I mean, if we lived in a world where nobody cared and you could do something like that matter-of-factly, that's what we're all going for. But, I mean, to me, when they do character changes like that, I'm hoping they have a, a, a real good reason why. So, but there you go. Uh, let's see... Um, mm, 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 mm. let's see what you guys are saying. Is anybody saying anything on this election day? I keep hearing Arcadia uh, singing election day. Maximum big surprise. Uh, this one comes from Willow. Willow says, actually, hang on. Um, actually, there's a lot. You know what? I haven't filtered these out. Let me filter these out uh, so I can actually see what people are saying uh, better. Uh, Ethan Holgate sends in a tip and says, Hi, Rob. I wouldn't be surprised if you already knew this, but I was looking on eBay the other day and I saw a beautiful thing. The Irishman Criterion Collection Blu-ray is coming out at the end of the month on Region 2 UK and Ireland, not sure about the US. Oh, yes, it is. And I may or may not have it on pre order. I'll let you decide. So, yes, I, I uh, absolutely. I actually I already have the Irishman on Blu ray. I know you're going, well, how can you do that? Stinky Tuna. I bought it from Stinky Tuna. I know, I know. Stinky Tuna is a website and they have bootleg stuff. I mean, I had to get Dragon Slayer from them too. And Song of the South and the Star Wars Holiday Special on Blu-ray, which is actually quite the package. <laughs> I, I highly recommend it. So, yes, it is coming out. Raymond Verrata is here, sends in a tip and says, Ma <laughs> speaking of Election Day, maximum big surprise, your smile is something new. I pull my shirt off and pray. We're sacred and bound to suffer the heat wave. Pull my shirt off and pray. We're coming up on re-election day. From Arcadia, 1985. That's right. And you who was on that track too? Grace Jones. Yes, she was. Sorry, I didn't do such a great job of singing. It's hard to sing like Simon the Bond. I wish I could, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, Willow is here, sends in a tip, and says, While played for laughs and an overall bad episode, in my opinion, Prophet and Lace showed Quark getting a full sex reassignment in a few hours and reversing without repercussions. If transitioning becomes that easy, I don't see why being trans would be any issue. I don't think it would be. Like we've talked about it on the show. I mean, I think anybody who is trans uh, that actually wants to make that transition uh, would do so. Like in the future, you would just do so. And, and also... You know, people that are 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 actually trans. Like I've said, I've said about, I've said this on the show. I believe it'll be a, a it'll absolutely be something that will be medically diagnosed. Sci you will scientifically be able to prove that trans people are really trans. That it's a real thing, and um, that it'll be measurable. I don't think we can measure that now, but uh, eventually they will. So I don't think it would be a, a big deal. That's why I don't think being non-binary would be a big deal in the future either. I mean, people are going to, you know, 
just wait till our our technology gets to the point where we can do all kinds of crazy body modification stuff um and and flesh can be reshaped i think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of very interesting transhuman qualities in people and uh there's going to be a lot more diversity but i don't think it is an issue Willow goes on to say, how much anxiety are you currently feeling about the election? Regardless of the results, there will be a lot of pissed off people. Yes. I mean, do I feel, you know, look, I will tell you this. There's never been a year like this since I've been alive with COVID, with everything that's going on, the the divisiveness in the country. Uh, the fact that I've taught, was talking about this yesterday, the fact that actually there are Americans that hate each other that no longer is being an American enough. Like you'd think that we would ultimately find common ground. No, there, there, the, 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 and maybe it's always been that way, but in my lifetime, I've never felt it as much as I do now. I've never felt that our country was as divided as it is now. I mean, sure. I didn't live during the civil war, but I really feel that the country is, is quite divided and it's, I don't quite get it. I don't understand how, how, I mean, I, I, I know that we have opposing points of view. A lot of people have oppo opposing points of view, but I don't, I don't really understand the hatred. I, what I don't understand is I would think that my baseline in terms of how I lead my life and how I would like to, to, to spend time in this world is you're constantly trying to improve yourself, you know, make things better for your fellow man. Um, because that to me is just the default position. You open doors for people when you can. If somebody is behind you at the grocery store and they have um, one item or two items and you've got bags full of items, you let you let them go in front of you. To me, there that that's just part of what it means to be a human being. And I've never actively wished harm on anyone. And I I think it's strange that now in this country there are so many people that that do. And it's weird. I know we've been whipped up by the media and all kinds of social media and, and the actual news media and things like that. But to me, I, I, I just don't under I don't understand it. I mean, I, I think that we should spend our time as human beings always bettering ourselves and bettering the world for the people around us, bettering our communities. And I, I don't understand people who don't proceed from that point of view. Um, I don't get it. And and I, I don't I don't hate somebody because we might have differing political ideologies. I actually quite enjoy somebody telling me about their, if, if we're diametrically opposed, I like hearing someone else's opposition to my viewpoints because then I learn something about myself and I learn something about them and you're, you're constantly reassessing what you think and what you believe. And I think that's important. And I don't understand why we're not seeing it now. You know, I used to love to watch debate shows and I still, you, you go back and watch like William F. Buckley's show, when he has people on and they have these intellectual debates and you're like, well, what happened to that planet? Why are we where we're at now? And I, 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 uh, my only anxiety is, is I do feel that we as a nation are getting monumentally dumber as the years go by. And from a number of factors, not because of our president necessarily, but there's a number of factors that I think it's very short sighted and, and where we have wound up. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a bummer. Paul in Long Beach says, to the people standing in long lines all around America in order to celebrate National Sandwich Day, I salute you. Democracy matters. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would really like to have a chicken parm sandwich if I could have my sandwich of choice. Maybe I'll have to track one down. Omega Relay is here and sends in a tip. Um, which Trump supporter is more ridiculous, Rob? Women or people of color? <laughs> well, um... That's a good question. I, I do think there are a lot of people that support Donald Trump that don't realize that he is definitely not necessarily looking out for their interests, um, which is sort of interesting to me. So I don't know who is more ridiculous. I wouldn't call them ridiculous because there's a lot of people that have reasons. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I know a lot of very intelligent people that are, in fact, Trump supporters or they, they support the Trump administration and certain policies that are put into place. I understand that. I think that's perfectly okay. What I don't understand is, I guess, having grown up with Donald Trump, I don't know how anyone takes him seriously as a, any, any kind of a leader. Um, that's what I find. I know what he represents, but I mean him personally, the man. What does he personally represent? And, you know, having read a lot of, of what 
Trump has written over the years and and all that, especially like I remember I read the I think everybody read the Art of the Deal when it came out. So, um, yeah. Um, Journey's End sent in a super chat. We are working on a horror short for the film festival, and I've been filming behind the scenes throughout the shoot so I can put together a making of later on. Excited to share. Well, Journey's End, I'll tell you what. If you do that, if you make a, a good making of, I'll play it on this show and I'll put it up on the on the um, uh, on the uh, on the website. Uh, the, I won't charge you an entry fee or anything like that. I mean, basically, the entry fee is more so we can defray the costs of things like printing the posters and and all that. It's not we're not like getting rich or pocketing that money. It's all going to be used for something. I I think so. But yeah, Omega Relay, I, I, I find it interesting when anybody votes against their own self-interest. It's bizarre. Uh, look, somebody just came on Call Me Ishmael, just became a post-geek singularity hero, became a member. Call Me Ishmael. Do you know there's a Star Trek novel called Ishmael by Barbara Hambly? And it's, it's basically Here Come the Brides meets, uh, actually, you know what? I can find it. Look at this. Ish, since, you, since you reminded me that, let's see. Uh, uh, novel. This is this is crazy. Let's see images. Let me grab the image. All right, you, you're, this is an actual Star Trek novel, and let me let me uh, get a, a good high res. Somebody has to have made a a high res picture of it. Oh, this is this one's pretty good. You're not going to believe this. This is an actual Star Trek novel. And it's it's been described as "Here Come the Brides," which is kind of set in Seattle. Um, but since Ishmael became a post geek singularity hero, why not celebrate his becoming one by showing you the cover of this Star Trek novel? Check this out. This is a real Star Trek novel. Look at that. The bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle. Uh, it's actually not a bad book, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, you think about crazy Star Trek stories. I like stuff like this. It was it was good. But that is a real Star Trek book. So thanks for becoming a member. And anybody can become a member of the Post Geek Singularity. We very much appreciate it. It's a way to support the channel on an ongoing basis. Hell, you can join for 99 cents a month if you want. Why not become a, a member? And we are going to have emojis for the ace, the arbiter of cinematic excellence soon mark c is here mark chure our own toxic fan even though he says that he's not really a toxic fan but i know what he means mark c says speaking of physical media god bless the spanish and their region free blu-rays i am now the proud owner of medicine man and true lies is on the way is that true there's a true lies spanish blu-ray huh i must investigate further because uh, you know I got to talk to Dieter Bastian about this. We should probably talk about that. Uh, the Richard became a member of the Post Geek Singularity. Well, thank you, The Richard, for doing that. And Call Me Ishmael obviously did too. So that's very, very exciting. Um, let's see. Oh, this one comes from Joe Dick. There's not enough Dick in my life. Uh, Joe Dick. You know, it's funny. My dad's name, Richard Dick Burnett. Uh, my friends, when they'd come over to my house and they knew my dad, they just thought it was hysterical and they'd be like, hello, Dick. And it was just, it was funny. I, I, it's a puerile joke, but I never get tired of it. Uh, Joe Dick writes, hi, Rob. Long time viewer, first time letter writer. In the first season of Star Trek Discovery, the Klingons conquer 80% of the Federation. Starfleet discovers a way to defeat them, but it means committing genocide. Michael Burnham decides to gamble with everyone's life and hands over the weapon. It works out because it's a TV show and they wanted it to work out. In the real world, imagine a hostile power had an unstoppable doomsday weapon. They conquer 80% of the world. The only way to stop them is to commit genocide. In TNG, Picard got chewed out for not doing this when he refused to send Hugh back to the Borg. He said the moral thing to do might not have been the right thing to do. In Discovery, killing all or almost all Klingons would not be morally right. In the real world, what would we do? Would it be the right thing to do? 
P.S. I asked about the statute of limitations for movie spoilers. In episode 89 of Whining About Movies, we were told not to spoil The Fly 2, a 31-year-old movie. It's a douche move to spoil something very recent, but it should be okay with something that old. I guess there is no consensus on that. Not that I'd do it anyway. P.P.S. Joe Dick is a character from the Canadian movie Hardcore Logo. I've seen Hardcore Logo. I did not know that. Now I know that. Touch me, I'm Dick. Just like in the movie Singles. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this one uh, comes from... Wait, Emil, I have, uh, Emil Johansson wrote this letter about Captain America, and I don't know where it is. I had it somewhere, but anyway, um, I don't know. Um, Mark C. goes on to say, by the way, if you dive into Tim Drake being black, you've changed his personality and who that character is. He's no longer Tim Drake. He's a whole new character, just Tim Drake in name only. Well, or, 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 I mean, look, I agree with you. He's not Tim Drake anymore. If you're, if you're, if you're going to try and do a translation, but if you're, if you're going to, uh, bring Tim Drake into a TV show and you want to re it's like, it's like when they made Nick Fury, they changed him into a black dude for, uh, the ultimate universe. I know it's the ultimate universe, so it's a different universe, but I, I, I don't mind. I mean, by the way, Brian Borden just became a member. Welcome to the post, but welcome to post geek singularity hero. I love that when people become members and I see the green pop up. I, I, I mean, I totally understand. I totally understand. But I think that you could reinterpret a character differently. I mean, it's the, it's the eternal question. But my whole thing is, if I was going to create, like, there's also the argument that you hear from many creators that they don't want hand-me-downs. You know, if you want to create a new black character, create a new black character that becomes just as indelible. Let Tim Drake remain Tim Drake and create a new character. Why do you have to take an old character and then transform them? That's why, like, I don't like the idea of Idris Elba being James Bond. Forget the fact that Idris Elba's age is what it is. He's too old to become a James Bond. He, he'd be into his, you know, he'd do one movie. He'd be, I think, in his 50s if, if they started shooting it today. But my whole thing about, like, James Bond being a literary character, he's a white character. He's always been that way. Um and so to to fundamentally make that change, the question will always be, well, why are you doing that? Could you have an Idris Elba play a James Bond? Sure, you could do it. But why wouldn't you want to create a new character for Idris Elba to play? Um, but there is that there is that argument. Plus, it's so weird to me that, that people think that you can take a character that's existed for however many years and then just change, race swap them, and that's some kind of... It, to me, it's just it's it's odd because the character, the literary character, was created a certain way by a certain creator, and I don't like the idea that people would go in and then alter that character for because of the times. You know, it doesn't seem fair to the original source material. But you know, you could if you did it. I mean, it would be interesting. Like, my, if if there was a black James Bond, I would be curious. Did the black James Bond suffer? Did he experience racism when he was growing up? If he was, obviously, the, the, the United Kingdom does not have quite a large black population. So what was it like growing up black in the UK before you went into the British Navy? Did you suffer the slings and arrows of racism? Is this something that you ever felt something about? Or what was that like? Maybe it wasn't. Um, but yeah, I, I always, it's just an odd thing, this, this impulse to change existing characters into things that they're not, I've always found odd. Not that I don't think it should be done. It's just odd because then you're like, it becomes an extra added layer that gets between you and the verisimilitude. You expect a character to be one way and the character... Like, for instance, I don't have a problem with uh, a black actor playing John Jones the Mar Martian Manhunter. That doesn't bother me. First of all, he's green, but he's an extraterrestrial. You know, it could, it's fine with me because the character is green. So, and I, I have no problem with that, obviously. was Is Carl Lumley? Does Carl Lumley do the voice of of the Martian Manhunter in the animated series. Um, I, I think it's a, a good idea. And and who plays him in Supergirl? What actor? But, yeah, I think it's bizarre. You're, you're right, Mark. I mean, you've changed the personality and who that character is. 
I agree. And I, I think it's weird that people do that. I honestly think it's a bit strange. Um... Omar94 weighs in and says, Hi, Rob. One of the best things to notice in a movie or TV show is when you spot an actor who would later become well-known or is more well-known from another movie and a show. For example, in the original Death Wish, Jeff Goldblum showed up for a small role in his first role ever. That happens a lot when I watch older TV shows, as I notice actors who are more well-known from other TV shows that time. For example, in the original Twilight Zone, William Shatner appeared in two episodes, one of which is A Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. One of the best, most popular, and quintessential episodes of the entire series. The other was Nick of Time. In the original Man from Uncle series, Kurt Russell appeared when he was really young. Russell would also appear in an episode of Gilligan's Island. Those are just some examples. But I always get a kick out of seeing people I recognize before they've really made it big. Me too. I love that. Thanks and live long and prosper. You know, Murray Hamilton, who played uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Vaughn, in... um, Jaws was in an episode of The Twilight Zone where, where the pitchman, he plays like death. What is it? The I forget the name of the episode. Um, and, and this pitchman has to pitch to him for the life of a little girl. Was it, is it one for the angels? I don't remember. Um, but, yeah, I, I love that. I love, love the Twilight Zone especially is chock-a-block full of famous actors. Robert Robert Redford, you know, Telly Savalas. It's <laughs> that's there you go there there's two actors that you always hear in the same breath telly savalas and robert redford but i guess you do when you're talking about the twilight zone um so yeah <laughs> there you go well listen ladies and gentlemen for some people on the east coast it is now seven o'clock seven p.m i don't know when the polls are closing around you but i think it's time t- for me to go get some tasty alcoholic beverages to drink tonight as the election results are coming in. So I want to thank you for joining me on this election day for Rob Observations, episode number 549. Tomorrow is our 550th episode of this show. Couldn't do it without you. Couldn't do it without the moderating staff. Couldn't do it without Mike Bodden. Couldn't do it without Greg Smith, the Richard, uh, MC Black Cap, Bunyan Snipe is here. Mr. Derringer is here. Josh Levesque is here. Um, And, you know, I couldn't do it without you guys. And remember, the Richard's always throwing some great watch parties over on the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page and the the, uh, Whining About Movies Facebook page. We were going to start our James Bond shows today, but I realized, well, it's the election night. Who's going to watch our YouTube show on election night? Nobody. So we're going to do that tomorrow. We're probably going to do Goldfinger. And we're either going to do Goldfinger and then on Thursday we might push one of them. We'll do Goldfinger tomorrow. Definitely on Her Majesty's Secret Service on Thursday or Friday. And then, of course, we will do Goldfinger. Or pardon me, we're doing Goldfinger on Her Majesty's And uh, Spy Who Love Me will be on Saturday. But, yeah, so we're going to do all that. I just wanted to let you guys um, know that because uh, who I was stupid when I was thinking about when we were going to do the shows. So there you go. And then, of course, uh, next Monday should be the day that our – uh, our show, the the show of, of Dieter and myself, uh, which we're now going to call Let's Get Physical Media, uh, we'll do that, and I've got to come up with a song, um, which we will do. Claudius is here. Claudius, I just want uh, everyone to know, he just said, oh, hi, Rob. Uh, Claudius says, oh, hi, Rob. Claudius will be joining us because he and I have very differing views on the James Bond movie Skyfall, which is going to be our last, that will be a week from Saturday. So this Saturday we're doing Spy Love Me, and then the following Saturday, Claude will join us again for um, Skyfall. And it was fun. We had him on our Do the Right Thing episode, uh, the Spike, Spike Lee's film, and that was a lot of fun. He's he's a very learned fellow, so I'm sure he's going to have some, we'll have some uh, robust back and forth about whether or not Skyfall is a good movie. I say No. I mean, it's a beautifully made movie, but I'm not a big fan of that movie. But Claudius is. Cardinal Sin sends in a super chat and says, you've got mail. Is that a reference to uh, the movie or do I literally have mail? Because um, I, I, I don't know if I do or not. Anyway, um, there you go. So I'm going to bring an end to this episode of Rob Observations, Rob Observations episode 
549. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope everyone's election day goes well. I hope uh, I hope whatever happens that the United States of America benefits. And let's uh, let's all get back to the business at hand, and that is being good citizens and helping one another out and making sure that the United States moves further into the 21st century uh, and gets off on a good foot or a new foot or something, any foot. What am I trying to say? I don't know. But I want to thank you all for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, if you haven't voted yet, you can still get to the polls. Why haven't you voted? Go go out there. Make it happen. Uh, I voted. There you go. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I've always liked election night. The first time I voted, by the way, was for Walter Mondale in 1988. That was my first presidential election. Look how well that that went. Anyway, on that note, I will say, oh, I'll be back tomorrow with with Az too. We're doing the, the we're doing uh, the prisoner show tomorrow at noon. So, be seeing you.